Brunel University London, who is going to present his paper entitled Civilian Mental Harm Warfare Courts, Quasi Judicial Bodies, and the Search for Assessment Standards. Dr. Solu Solomon is a lecturer in the Division of Public and International Law at the Brunel University London School of Law and co director of the Brunel University London International Law Group. Author of the book The Justiciability of International Disputes and co editor of another volume on the application of international humanitarian law, Dr. Solomon has previously been a visiting scholar and fellow in a number of academic institutions, including King's College London, Tel Aviv University, and Humboldt University in Berlin. Dr. Solomon's opinions have also appeared widely in the media, in outlets such as The Times, The Financial Times, The Independent and Newsweek magazine. And along these lines, in the Brunel University London School of Law, he is also leading the Emerging Law Voices uh, podcast series on matters of international law. Solomon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Indeed, it's a pleasure, uh, Dr. Curie, to be here in the Lincoln Law School and to speak before you and all the colleagues about the main topic of uh, my international law research, a topic that uh, has brought me also here in England, King's College London, to do my PhD studies. And I'm pursuing it also in the realms of the Brunel University London. And the topic, as denoted by the title, is about civilian mental harm and warfare. It's a topic that is very much disputable, not because somebody does not want, in essence, to attribute any legal value to civilian mental harm or to identify with the pain of the civilians, but uh, because, first of all, armies and states are very skeptical about it. And because, indeed, it's a topic that uh, begets very many questions regarding to the assessment standards. How do we define, first of all, civilian mental harm? what actually qualifies as harm that has also a legal significance. And secondly, what are the standards that we must apply in order to assess this harm? And apart from me, the topic is uh, an issue of a global concern, a global analysis. We have people writing about this from Israel, for example, Professor Eliab Libli from Tel Aviv University. We have Schmidt, Michael Schmidt, who is now the University of Reading and also has affiliations with Harvard University that also write about rights. Uh, that in essence, uh, they speak about the civilian mental harm and warfare problems around its legal assessment. So first of all, the first question that I mentioned before that I want to sit upon and speak about more is the question of definition. How we define civilian mental harm? Now, this is a prelude to my main question, which is how we assess civilian mental harm in warfare. Of course, I will not enter the question what is warfare because this is more evident, although again disputable. But I leave it aside and I take it as a precedent that in essence we define, we speak about warfare in the conventional meaning of the word warfare, not as economic warfare or cyber warfare. And along these lines, the question first of all that has to be answered is whether we are speaking about civilian mental harm in the course of one or multiple attacks. And the question is cardinal because, as we are going to see, the answer is a bit different regarding the legal assessment of such harm. If, in essence, we're speaking about one isolated attack, then we have to speak about the balance that the military commander is called to wage each time between the military advantage and the injury that is caused to the affected civilians. Now, as we know, the so-called use in bello proportionality principle, the proportionality principle that pervades the laws of war, is being entrenched in the first additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions and speaks generally about the concept of injury. It doesn't spe specify physical or mental injury. So on, along these lines, Eliav Liebrich was one of the first who actually argued that the concept of injury should be broadened to encompass there also mental injury. And if that's the case, we can see that uh, in all cases, the military commander, as he or she undertakes the whole balancing exercise vis-a-vis -vis the anticipated military advantage, in order to see how many physical casualties are going to be able 
to stop the execution of a certain military operation, the same exercise must be undertaken when the injury concerns the mental sphere. So far, this is understandable, but again, it begets certain problems. For example, the issue of predictability. How does the military commander know this simple question that has a complex answer? How can the military commander predict in advance the mental harm that is going to be incurred to the affected civilians? When it comes to physical casualties, this calculation is easier up to a point to be taken because we know, for example, the density of civilian existence, of civilian presence in certain urban areas, and we can know in advance how our attacks are going to affect the relevant civilians. But mental harm is more kind of dissected, is more kind of dispersed along the civilian population. And thus, it's much more difficult to predict. Moreover, when we speak about mental harm, there are different forms of mental harm. We have psychiatric diseases and disorders, like apart from insanity, post-traumatic stress disorder, even depression. Actually, depression, according to the findings of the mental health sciences, is a more common disorder that is being begotten as a result of war trauma and civilian war trauma. But post-traumatic stress disorder is more actually discussed in the relevant literature and jurisprudence, also by scholars like Lieblich, like Schmidt that I mentioned before, because post-traumatic stress disorder, according again to the precepts of mental health sciences, can be easily traced and needs to be traced to a particular event in order to be diagnosed. And along these lines, if we have an isolated attack, everything makes sense. We have one particular event, one particular attack that begets post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder is severe enough to qualify as a form of mental harm. And then we can start discussing what is the legal significance of this incurred mental harm. Now, of course, uh, many uh, other scholars will attack this uh, kind of idea based on the issue of anticipated, based on the characteristics of the foreseeability of the anticipated injury. And uh, in essence, here we have to define what is the grade, what is the volume of anticipation that I have to have in place in order to say that I must stop a particular attack. In other words, even if I have, if the military commander has suspicions that a certain attack will lead even to post-traumatic stress disorder, should he stop the particular operation? Moreover, the particular military commander has suspicions or even almost certainty that a particular military operation will beget post-traumatic stress disorder, but will beget post-traumatic stress disorder only to a particular segment of the population. We know, for example, also based on the mental health uh, sciences, that women and children have more chances to experience post-traumatic stress disorder vis-a-vis -vis men. And on this account, if the military commander, for example, is ready to wage an operation in urban areas where the main residents are women and children, or if, in essence, the military commander wants to undertake an operation in the night where people are sleeping and he knows he is going, the soldiers are going to enter residential areas, for example, to search for a suspect. Along these lines, the question is whether this begotten mental harm is enough in order to thwart and stop the whole operation. So on this, Lieblich, in his uh, chapter in the co-edited volume, I had the pleasure to co-edit some years ago with Derek Jeans from Texas University and the late Jackson Malgoto from the University of Manchester, in essence tells us that we have to understand that when it comes to using bellow proportionality, we have the foreseeability. We don't have necessarily to prove that mental harm will surely be created, will surely merge, but we have to have the possibility. We have to say that, uh, in essence, stakes are that this is going to be the case. And indeed, 
we know also from domestic jurisdictions, domestic criminal jurisdictions, that we never speak with certainty when we have to attribute a certain offense and when we want to, to hold somebody criminal culpable for a particular offense. In common law jurisdictions, for example, we have the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt. And in continental law, we have the whole idea of full conviction. The judge must have full conviction that a certain offense uh, was undertaken or that the culprit knew. So we can never prove 100% that the culprit knew because you cannot enter the culprit's mind, you cannot enter the mind of the military commander, but we must be able to sufficiently say that this military commander undertook all the parameters and all the efforts in order to minimize the civilian casualties, including the mental harm due to be incurred. So the first question about the definition had all these parameters and hurdles when it comes to isolated attacks. When it comes now to attacks that happen simultaneously or attacks that create a war havoc, for example, now in the war in Ukraine, we have continuous attacks. We have now the creation of a general atmosphere of attacks, recurrent attacks, systematic attacks, Along these lines, in his chapter, uh, Eliav Liebrich didn't speak so much about this scenario and the role of mental harm, and uh, neither did also the other scholars. This is a new direction that scholarships on uh, mental harm and warfare should take, the direction that should lead us in the future. And indeed, we have actually, we scholars that uh, research on the issue, we have also to find answers how in essence and if law is uh, enough in order to give us the answers how and if we can assess uh, the mental harm in caring to civilians in the context of simultaneous it brings together issues of attribution questions of compensation and uh, questions also of proof how we prove once again that any incurred harm mental harm is a result of this general war climate. And in essence, this brings me to the main topic of uh, my intervention today, which is about the assessment of civilian mental harm. So in essence, uh, again, as everything in international law and in law, as we know in general, everything is disputed. And this is maybe the beauty of law, that everything has two sides. So when it comes to mental harm and warfare, we have uh, the classical stance that, as I said in the beginning of this uh, seminar, uh, is being undertaken mainly by armies and by states, that mental harm should not be touched when we speak about warfare. Because in essence, warfare by its definition begets fear. This is a stance and this is a conclusion that also Dinstein, for example, Joram Dinstein, uh, the famous emeritus professor of Tel Aviv University delineates in one of his uh, books. And along these lines, we should be very cautious indeed when we speak about mental harm and warfare. Because if we scholars who want to make a contribution to the field are not cautious, the danger lurks that a very widespread and very general uh, dealing with the subject is going to lead to the subject becoming amorphous and thus not applicable to real scenarios. So once we assume that we are not speaking just about the fear that is being begotten to uh, the affected civilians as a result of attacks, of an attack, we have to have more tangible criteria of how we define, in essence, first of all, the attack and how we define the mental harm. And along these lines, I would like to share with you some thoughts. But before I share with you these thoughts, here I delineate also the different stances that have been taken by the international courts and court judicial bodies so far. It's very interesting that the notion of civilian mental harm and warfare pervades all the spectrum of international adjudicating bodies both judicial and both quasi-judicial. And the role of quasi-judicial bodies especially is very important as we know the last few years, 
with other commissions of inquiry. So this makes it more cardinal for this commission of inquiry to establish some norms on the issue. And this was also the object of my article in the Journal of International Dispute Settlement some years ago. So in essence, the problematic starts from the fact that so far these bodies take different approaches. They either have no reference to any symptoms of mental harm. They speak generally about mental harm, but with no symptoms. So yes, they tell us that civilians experience mental harm or serious mental harm, but with no further elaboration. Secondly, another approach they can take, again, we're talking about now different bodies in different instances. A second approach is for a reference to exist to real facts that uh, in essence can beget mental harm and serious mental harm, but these bodies don't tell us how these facts can substantiate mental harm. A third approach is that these bodies bring in experts, mental health experts, to testify about the mental harm that has been incurred to the civilians. But the problem here lies that these mental health experts don't speak about the individuals in concreto who actually testify before these bodies, being either courts or quasi judicial bodies, but in general, about the mental harm in to the general civilian population. In that sense, especially when we are talking about criminal law and international criminal law, we have, as we know, the principle of legality. Nullum crimen sine lege certa. We have to have a certain provision, a certain offense, and the minutes, the details of the offense, have to be painted in order to be able to lead to persecutions. So it's not enough to say, for these experts to say that serious mental harm has been created. They must prove to us how there is a linkage between the acts of the culprit and the emerged mental harm. And also they can must tell us what are the symptoms, what are the manifestations that the particular individuals who come to testify as victims and witnesses in the particular trials especially, but also before commissions of inquiry, how their particular symptoms constitute serious mental harm. So for example, if I have a commission of inquiry and there I have a person appearing and saying that as a result of an aerial attack, I witnessed now I had nightmares or I had trepidation and my heart beats increased, both of which are symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder and of trauma, then these experts must link between the specific symptoms and post-traumatic stress disorder, depression or another psychiatric disorder. And not only this, these experts must proceed and must undertake a further step. They must tell us whether the particular symptom, symptoms that the particular individual experiences, are they the exception or the norm when it comes to the affected population? As we understand, this cannot be done through the testimony of the particular individual. This needs a meta-regression maybe study that these mental health experts must undertake and must present to the adjudicating bodies. And why is this important? Because in essence, if we don't have a particular, if these uh, symptoms that are being uh, stated by the particular individual are an exception, then we cannot actually condemn, we cannot convict a certain state or a certain culprit for war crimes or crimes against humanity, because exactly we need the systematic element. Now, again, in war crimes, we do not need the systematic element. In war crimes, positivistically, it's enough that a war crime has happened even once and the person can be convicted. But still, also in war crimes, we need also the gravity meaning the more international and war crimes are being committed, the higher the probability is that the particular culprit is going to be indicted in the international fora. Because we know that international fora, like the International Criminal Court, have in essence very limited resources and time. And for this reason, we give as international community the emphasis is on attacks that have the most widespread impact to the civilian population. So these experts must speak about this widespread impact, something that is not being currently done. Sometimes it is evidence that the victim 
will have experienced mental health. For example, we have cases of rape coming before the international criminal courts. Everybody agrees that uh, experiencing rape is a trauma. But again, these mental health experts must tell us how the particular victim experienced this trauma, the particular symptoms that the victim experienced, and how these victims, are, these symptoms are so dire in order to be able to substantiate also the serious mental harm element and threshold that is needed in international criminal courts in order to hold international convictions. Because as we know, international criminal law, the statutes of the different courts speak about serious mental harm, the intentional causation of serious mental harm. So here I open the Vendania, I open the spectrum, not only to the incurred mental harm that happens on a kind of uh, incidental manner, but also to the deliberate incurrence of mental harm, again in the crimes of genocide, in the crimes of rape, and other instances that have already uh, been before the International Criminal Courts, and there is relevant jurisprudence on this. And uh, having said this, in essence, the most evident solution that somebody can think about on how to assess the incurred civilian mental harm is to bring in mental health experts in international trials or in international procedures. But again, this is not enough. Why? Because in domestic trials, when we bring in the mental health expert, what we are asking from this mental health expert is just for him or her to tell us if the defendant, for example, is crazy or not. Most, as you know, most usually we have cases of insanity that are being brought before domestic trials in cases of mental harm. But in the international contours, we are asking for something more, and the something more is being synopsized in what I said before. We want the particular symptoms and the comparison also with, in essence, the wider population to see whether we are speaking about the exception or about the norm. Now, in order to do this, there are different ways to proceed. Before you today, I would like to bring two venues that I've written about. The first is in the epicenter of my PhD, which was undertaken at King's College London. And the second is my recent article in the Transnational Law and Contemporary Problems Journal. So the first venue refers to the application of the Dober standard in international criminal law. The Dober standard in a US standard that stems from criminal procedure there, actually stem from the civil, it exists also in the civil procedure in the US and also in the criminal procedure and actually epitomizes the precept that when we have expert opinions, when we have matters of expertise, the judges, the adjudicators must always decide based on reliable expert opinions. Reliable expert opinions which are not only fetched into the trial, but then the judge has the discretion to actually assess the opinions themselves. Of course, as you can understand, the second stage, meaning the fact that the judge becomes the gatekeeper of science and can assess himself or herself the opinions of the mental experts is more controversial. That's why in the states itself, uh, there we have also the 50 different states in the United States, and each jurisdiction gives a different answer, whether they employ the Dober standard or the antagonistic standard, which is called the Fry standard, which speaks about the fact that it's enough for the judge to take in only the expert opinion without him further having the ability to scrutinize the validity, the epistemological validity of that opinion. But more importantly, for our discussion, I take into account and I underline the fact that in order to have an opinion ab initio to scrutinize, we must have a reliable opinion. So the Dobert standard epitomizes the necessity for experts to fetch in opinions and for judges to speak on matters of expertise uh, only based on reliable opinions. And when we say reliable opinions, not only opinions that come from reliable organs like a respected psychiatrist or psychologist, but an opinion that actually respects the precepts of psychology or psychiatry. In our case, 
based on the steps that I delineated before, an opinion that would be in concreto a description of the relevance of the symptoms of the civilian vis-a-vis -vis the general attack and also vis-a-vis -vis the general population. So the application of the double standard of international criminal law uh, was my argument, as I said in my thesis, there I asked that it's possible for international criminal law to actually endorse the double standard because it pertains to almost to all jurisdictions around the world. And uh, for my PhD, I examined around 30 jurisdictions all over the world, from Asia, the Americas, Europe, Africa, in order to uh, portray my argument. So this is one way of proceeding uh, forth. Then the other in way is to rely very much on domestic jurisdictions. And this was the object of my second article in the Transnational Law and Contemporary Problem Journal. We see that already criminal domestic jurisdictions discuss a law to war crimes, not only discuss, adjudicate also. That was very much highlighted in the realms of the ISIS crimes and the ISIS state. And we have prosecutions, as I think you may aware of, uh, in a number of European states, from Sweden to Germany to the Netherlands. And there we had the decapitations of the victims. And the whole discussion was that the dignity of these victims was being compromised once they were being shown on videos uh, and live broadcasted once they were dying. So my argument was that in essence, we have to take into account also the mental harm that this, the anguish that these victims experienced few moments before the ultimate death. And also courts should take this mental harm into account. And delving into the concept, I delineated in the article certain elements that pervade all the jurisprudence of domestic courts when it comes to mental harm. And the common characteristics that I saw there is first of all that very uh, often, as we discussed before, domestic courts linked mental harm with the concept of insanity. And this is something maybe expectable, as we know so from criminal practice. But at the same time, we have courts in the Netherlands, in Germany, not necessarily linking mental harm with established psychiatric diseases, but also giving rise to the gravity of the symptoms, meaning that if I have grave symptoms, mental symptoms, even if I don't have a diagnosed disease like post-traumatic stress disorder or depression, still I can speak about and incur mental harm to the particular persons. And I'm speaking now not only in the realms of criminal law, but also in the realms of tort law. So along these lines, we see here the importance of what I said before, how important it is to fetch in these mental health experts before the quasi-judicial bodies in order for the latter to be able to assess the legal validity of any experienced symptoms. And something more, and with this I close my first comments and I look forward to a fruitful discussion for your questions. In essence, this is essential to be done, not only as I said before courts, but all the more so before quasi-judicial bodies, because it is in the latter that unfortunately we face also accusations of politicization. And in the international law landscape, which is very much attacked by populist views, in the international law landscape, which by definition is considered to be political and too much political, we want to minimize any attacks to the integrity of international law. And it is to the interest of international justice also for this field and aspect to be entrenched through rigid legal rules, especially given that quasi-judicial bodies do not have established evidentiary rules. So everything seems to be more fluid when it comes to quasi-judicial bodies like Commission for Inquiry. And my attempt was, in essence, in the particular article, to solidify more the concept of mental harm and civilians there. And my broader research is to blend everything together and show how mental harm and civilians can be assessed and how it can ultimately be defined even broadly and more broader than just post-traumatic stress disorder. With this, I thank you very much and I look forward to your questions.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sholom, for your interesting presentation. And now uh, let's uh, start with the questions. Um, could you please, uh, Sholom, um, stop sharing your slides? Yes. Or unless it will be a little Yes, yes, yes I stopped sharing, so everything must be now set. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, any questions? To Dr. Solomon. Professor Burns. That's all. Yeah, very interesting. Not something I've, I've looked at before, but it certainly opens up lots of doors for, for discussion about how far international law can and, and should go in these difficult situations. So I, I guess off the top of my head, I, a couple of questions, I, I suppose. So. One is, I guess, in the kind of broader context of war around conflicts, there will be a kind of general threat to a, a population. There will be that kind of climate of war, that kind of climate of fear. And then there may be particular incidents which, I guess, add to that, exacerbates it. But for me, it strikes me as being quite difficult to perhaps separate out the, the kind of elements of, of stress or trauma which are caused by the two and that might be quite a difficult thing to to unpack so is that something that you're you're, you're kind of sensitive to are you just focused on particular incidents so if there's a, an attack on a civilian population you're only really concerned with that and you have to forget the the general climate or do you think we can actually kind of disaggregate these these elements and then the second one was i appreciate the idea that it's it's, it's very um, difficult to assess trauma and obviously you're working to kind of try and provide some more objectivity of that through the use of, of experts but to me it kind of strikes me you get to the point where you sort of say that actually an expert has to say how an individual is affected by the trauma of war and you almost get to the situation where the expert is effectively speaking or is a voice for that individual who's affected and they might be the best person to actually say what the trauma is because it is so individual so yeah, that, that uh, it, it kind of, I guess it adds to the kind of complexity of, of assessing uh, mental harm. So but just some thoughts there. Yes, thank you very much, Richard. If I can uh, directly uh, answer. Uh, first of all, your first comment uh, has to do correctly uh, with the interrelation between the so-called use ad bellum, use in bellum and use post bellum. And uh, in essence, uh, your question touches upon the fact that in my presentation, I related only to use in Bello. So I spoke about uh, the mental harm of civilians only in use in Bello. Just a brief parenthesis, maybe for people who uh, are listening to this video and also for participants who may not be aware of these Latin appellations in international law, use ad bellum is in essence the whole uh, body of laws that pertains to the opening of force under which conditions we can undertake, uh, we can go to the use of force, uh, comprising the right to self-defense. Use in bello is the use of force once hostilities have already opened, this is what I discussed now regarding the mental harm and protection of civilians. And use post bellum is in essence transitional justice, how we can amend all the traumas that have befallen the affected societies. So your question, Richard, referred to the stage of use ad bellum, which indeed there is also a relevant, uh, there is a kind something to say there regarding mental harm and most notably the concept of fear. For example, in 1967, we had the Arab countries that border Israel threatening Israel's, Israel for annihilation. And then Israel undertook the first step and attacked first Egypt. And everybody spoke that we have a clear case of self-defense. Why? Because in essence, the climate of fear that was created in the Israeli society or the Israeli establishment was enough in order to justify the exercise of the right to self-defense. On the other hand, we have the same question, Richard, that you uh, now bring to the table regarding if we stay, for example, now in the case of Israel in the Middle East that I started speaking about, the case of Israel and Iran. Iran, we know that is an enemy of Israel. In Iran, we know that uh, has also this uh, uh, nuclear uh, energy and there is a question whether it wants also to build or not nuclear weapons. Israel contends 
that there is a threat from the Iranian regime. And the question is, is it enough if Israel fears? So once again, I will resort to the fear. Is it enough to say that Israel can actually preemptively attack Iran? The answer would most probably be no here. So here we see that we speak though about the concept of fear, which is a bit different than the concept of mental harm of civilians. And that's why my differentiation in the analysis. Uh, so these were my two comments regarding the first part of your question that we're talking about. I talked about mental harm and not just fear. And I talked about use in bello and not use uh, ad bellum. Uh, about the second thing about how we define um, the how the experts in essence speak uh, for the victim. Um, of course, I never envisioned. I think you imply that there is a fear, there is a danger. We bring the expert that he's going maybe to usurp to take the place of the victim. We don't let the victim express his or her own pain regarding the incident. And of course, this should not be the case. This is, I never thought about this in these terms. No, we let the victim say his or her story. We identify as human beings with the pain of the victim. We respect the pain of the victim. But at the same time, we bring, like in domestic trials, we bring in the expert in order to tell us how this pain of the victim can be translated in legal language and legal terms. Because after all, the judge needs the legal attribution in order to proceed. We're not, uh, law is not psychology. So these were my initial thoughts on your questions. Yeah. Richard, do you want to add a point? Yeah, d just to clarify, yeah, I mean, perhaps my, my use of the word fear was maybe a little bit loose there, but I'm not specifically talking about resort to war, the, the use ad bellum. I'm thinking more specifically about trauma, which is occasioned to individuals or populations simply by virtue of the fact that conflict exists. So whether or not you are the subject of a particular attack, you know, a bomb, uh, an assault, a rape as an individual, there will still be trauma which is, is, is caused to civilian populations by virtue of the ongoing general conduct of, of hostilities. And that is something which would still fall within the, I guess, the, the use in bellow, I, I suppose. So, and so it's really about how you actually, I, I guess it's a question about how you assess that and whether or not you need to distinguish it. But that was all, I, I think. So I, I just wanted to make that clarification. Yes, Richard, indeed, this is, uh, this is the second scenario that I mentioned also before, when we have an ongoing uh, trauma, an ongoing military operations, like now in Ukraine, for example, we have trauma that is not being begotten only by a particular attack. Mm -hmm. So if we want actually to help Ukrainian civilians and actually uh, pay a significance, a legal significance to their mental harm, we must think more massively, more globally and more holistically how we can actually maybe uh, assess this uh, trauma. On this, I said that scholars so far have not touched the issue because it's more complicated than just an isolated attack. But I hinted that maybe the asset comes uh, through the concept of compensation. We have also, for example, in the realms of international criminal law, how we give compensation to the victims of atrocities when we had thousands of victims. So we have some modes. It goes to allocation, to the allocation of responsibility, to the allocation of compensation. It touches also upon tort law. So I think it's an interesting junction of the research that will touch also upon uh, the convergence with tort law. Thank you, Sorian. Nicholas, you have a question? Yeah, thanks. Uh... Uh, very interesting presentation. Um, again, I'm, I'm I'm not an expert on that field, but I, I'm I'm doing research in human rights, and I was just uh, wondering what's your position as to uh, the superposition of the human rights rule uh, in terms of conflict, because there is and and how then uh, would you do would you define or use the the standards that you have used uh, within the criminal law and apply it to human rights law? Or should the standards then uh, in terms of the impact on mental harm be different in the context of human rights. But if, and, and of course, then if both set of rules uh, are applicable at the same time, uh, what happens? Thanks. Thank you very much, Nicolas, for your question. Indeed, uh, this is uh, the topic of my article that I penned for the Journal of uh, Confidence Security Law and uh, about the junction between mental harm and the vida digna idea that we know is, exists in human rights law. 
the idea that we had an operation by the Philippines in the Japalali case, and we had a person that is being wooden and it's being left, although the operation, the military operation is unveiling, the wounded person is left to be bleeding. And not only this, but they don't call the hospital, the Filipino forces kind of neglect the mental harm, the mental anguish of the person. And then I wrote, and in essence, the question, the issue goes, the incident goes before the UN Human Rights Committee, and the UN Human Rights Committee finds a violation of the article to life, but they never speak about their uh, life, the right to mental uh, health. Of course, we know the right to mental health belongs to the socioeconomic rights, so they don't fall, it doesn't fall necessarily, positivistically speaking, to the ambit of the UN Human Rights Committee. But at the same time, we also do know that the UN Human Rights Committee has linked the right to life also with parameters of health standards. And along these lines, I argued in the article that indeed we can deem that uh, mental harm cannot be sustained even in the discourse of human rights and even in the discourse of the right to life. But as you understand, Nicholas, in the described scenario now, this is a scenario that pertains to warfare operations, but not as uh, discussed before with Richard, operations that refer to ongoing trauma, etc. But in concrete, or the specific operation where we have, in essence, the wounding of a person, the mental anguish. And this mental anguish it can be more uh, easily attributed to a specific act and more easily constitute a violation of the right to health and, of course, the right to mental health. The same idea I put forth in my Jill talk piece regarding recurrent attacks. There I wrote about the fact that recurrent attacks, because in essence we can have a prediction of the whole issue, and because in essence they take place through certain planning, which is more called blood planning, then we have indeed a possible violation also of article of the relevant articles regarding the right to health when it comes to human rights law. So the answer is yes to your question, but I think in different scenarios than the scenarios I described now in my presentation or discussed now with Richard. Thank you, Solon. Uh, do you want to make uh, to make a follow-up question, Nicholas? Yeah, yeah, just briefly. Uh, but but the follow-up would be in terms of the standard of proof that you described, because the standard of proof in international criminal law and in human rights are quite different. So so everything to to what extent everything you've described in the context of international criminal law would then be applicable to to human rights in terms of all the standards of proof and evidence that you've that you've discussed. Yes, I never argued that we should have the same standards of proof when it comes to mental harm in different fields of international law. I delineated, and this is also something that, uh, and thanks Nicholas for pointing out, because we have to understand also when I discuss the cases of rape, the cases of genocide. So even in international criminal law, we have different crimes involved with mental harm. So on this aspect, mental harm and civilians is a broad concept. I don't argue that it should be tackled with along the same ways in all the different branches of international law. Sometimes it will take the form of mental anguish, international human rights law. Sometimes it will take the form of using bellow proportionality and the balancing parameters of the military commander, the laws of war. Sometimes, and this is my new article now, it's going to take in post bellum the nexus between disability and in essence uh, mental harm so we see different facets but the idea remains the same and the idea is how we define it that we define in a tangible way that like the international criminal court and the international criminal tribunal for the former yugoslavia have said that it's not just fear it's strong fear speaking about terror there so something tangible and secondly we assess it through the help of mental health experts which who have though to be concrete, who have to be specific, not like it happens now that they come in the trial, they just utter generalities without telling us the nexus between the acts and the incurred harm. Thank you, Solon. Are there any other questions? Let me please ask you, Solon. Yes, please tell me, uh, the, please, uh, Richard. No, uh, Maria, no, no, no. please come in first. I, I was just going to ask a, a slightly different question because I'm, I'm quite interested in the idea of proportionality. And I, I don't know if you've looked at this in your 
your research. And obviously, when you've got decisions being taken about what attacks to undertake and what the impacts are going to be, not just in terms of physical, but also incidental mental harm. Um, do you think that um, your research here in, in terms of how mental health you know, experts factor in or, 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 or estimate harm could be used in those scenarios too, I, I guess, in terms of kind of military decisions? Yes, this is indeed a very useful parameter. Nowadays, this is also a very pertinent parameter because nowadays we have artificial intelligence and we have also the algorithms. Uh, so in essence, with the use of algorithms, which is not artificial intelligence, which by the way is already happening, takes place to certain armies in the world right now, we already, the military commanders can more easily predict also the psychological harm. So, and they can wait afterwards the proportionality vis-a-vis -vis the anticipated military advantage. But it's very interesting here that also when it comes to the military advantage, how we define it, there are two schools of thought. One school of thought says you have to look each individual operation, and one second school of thought speaks about the overall military advantage, and there is not a clear-cut answer. So here we enter different discussion, how we define the military advantage, how we define also the balance with the incurred harm. For example, we speak also about gender also studies. What if women are mostly affected? We speak about the rights of the child. What if the children are mostly affected? So many discussions. This is, I think, the beauty of this topic, and that's why I'm fascinated in my research uh, on it uh, throughout the last few years, because it has many facets and it binds together different fields of law. But I, I guess yeah, there's separate issues there. So if a military commander has to make an assessment, they will calculate or they will have an algorithm or they will receive advice on what, for example, the consequences of this attack are in terms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's just a value. They will then weigh that against whether or not the military advantage justifies causing that and other types of harm. And they will you know, do that according to the doctrine of, of proportionality. But the fact is that they have that data, they have that information, which is used to assess or calculate what the harm is. So presumably that can then be made available if there are breaches of the rules of war and where compensation or reparations are being made. Yes, of course, and you yeah, reinforce okay. also the voices. I agree with you. Uh, and also this is what Liblich wrote, and this is also what I believe I haven't written an article specifically. Maybe in the future I'm going to touch upon the question, how do we know that I mentioned in the slides? Mm -hmm. uh, this was indeed uh, also mentioned in other articles, this question, how can we know some people who are more skeptical about tackling the issue of mental harm mm -hmm have maybe uh, brought forth this uh, question. But as you mentioned, Richard, I don't think it's a valid question in the sense in our days, in our era, uh, technology helps even more. And that's why it augments the responsibility of the military commander to do take into account also the mental health. In other words, there are no justifications now for the military commander to evade this calculation. Thank you. Are there any other questions? For Solon. Solon, uh, have you made the distinction between the national courts and quasi-judicial bodies with regard to the challenges that you have described? Yes. For example, in identifying, uh, perhaps you made this point, and I'm not sure. Yes, uh, I made the distinction. And I say, first and foremost, the most important thing we have to understand, that's why actually in my uh, article in the Journal of International Dispute Settlement, it focused on quasi-judicial bodies. Because international courts have an established panel, they have an established evidentiary procedure, and they have an established mandate. The established mandate is a common theme with the quasi-judicial bodies, but the rest are lacking when it comes to quasi-judicial bodies. No preset evidential rules and no preset, in essence, composition of this panel. And that leaves everything to be more fluid when it comes to quasi-judicial bodies. And this was the strengthening of my argument that, in essence, that's why we must double now. We must uh, kind of augment our efforts to put certain norms, especially when it comes to mental harm, when on, on its own it's a virgin topic in international law. So we have a new topic, mental harm, being dealt by bodies which by definition also are open and volatile to certain attacks of politicization and to certain challenges regarding composition or the law of evidence. 
Thank you. Are there any other questions? Then, thank you very much, uh, Sorin, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, thank you all for your attendance. And I also thank you for inviting me here to this uh, webinar. It was uh, very nice for you and interesting to be also with you. And um, indeed, you, uh, a nice evening to My everybody. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.